hope that what I said gave you at least uh, a taste of what's going on, at least in this, uh, from, from this perspective, on, uh, on the connection between amplitude and gravitational waves. And uh, hopefully sufficient information to read through the literature and uh, perhaps jump in. Right, so uh, back a few days when I started, I said that it was, I said among the tasks for myself that I would also point to some open problems. And I don't think I did that until now, but uh, let me spend the remaining hour or so, um, you know, actually uh, doing some of that and also filling in some of the, some of the holes that I left along the way. So, um, one of the things that we discussed a little bit before, uh, before, um, um, before the break uh, was about this kind of funny-looking graphs or funny-looking cuts. And we assigned here some uh, gravitons in the potential region, but these guys could potentially be uh, in the radiation region. So, uh, and then uh, at the time we said that these guys, so two are two radiation gravitons, give us something that we call conservative radiation reaction. So there is a little bit of uh, intuition about what exactly these things do, right? And uh, what kind of Hamiltonian one might expect, given graphs or given processes of this type. This, uh, I mean, I'm going to say in a second what I mean by that, but if you actually do the calculation, you're going to find an amplitude that looks perfectly reasonable, just, you know, some function of momentum. And you can run through everything that I said, and you're going to find a Hamiltonian or a potential that looks perfectly reasonable. So this is uh, uh, three loops. This is g to the 4 over r to the 4. I'm some function of p. There's nothing funky if you look at this. However, there is important physics that's different between this and, uh, say, what might be going on at lower loops here. Or, in, or also at three loops when everybody is potential. So the physics that's different here is that radiation gravitons are really close to on-shell. Like for all intents and purposes, you might think of them as on-shell. Uh, so, uh, because they are on shell, they can propagate over a long period of time. So, uh, from far away, a graph like this would look like something that Ricardo might draw. Right? So, there's a graviton that leaves the system. This double line is, are these two lines. And they are bound together by these potential gravitons that are exchanged between them. So, this binary system can emit a radiation graviton, which because it's radiation, it goes on for a while. And uh, at some point, the binary still gravitates, so there is a gravitational pull that acts on this. And then eventually, it gets reabsorbed. So uh, what does this mean? It means that the interactions in the binary due to this graviton know at some later time about stuff that happened way, way in the past because of this graviton that left the binary propagated on its own and then it gets reabsorbed. So there is some long delta t here. So this suggests that the Hamiltonian should in fact be non-local. Because of this. However, how do we reconcile this stuff with a perfectly valid function of momentum which it's a potential, it generates something instantaneous. How do we square this? Why, where, where are we losing this information about the non-locality of the Hamiltonian? The answer to this question is that it's this Hamiltonian that's non-local is really an off-shell Hamiltonian. It's a Hamiltonian that doesn't exactly know what kind of trajectory the particles are moving on. Whereas here, we are constructing everything from a scattering process. That Hamiltonian knows very well that there are two particles coming in from infinity. They do their thing, and then they go off to infinity. So uh, the answer is non-locality is lost with quotation marks because we build in 
scattering trajectory or scattering motion or hyperbolic motion. So uh, big open question. What do we do about this? We, uh, we would very much like to use scattering amplitudes to say something interesting for uh, the bound binary problem. However, we have this little issue. How do we solve that? That's one of the big unsolved problems, and in my opinion, perhaps the biggest or the most important one, because without solving this, we sort of, you know, we talk to our own little resonance box. The binary people, bound binary people who are interested in LIGO observations and so on, uh, they will stop paying attention to us if we, if we can't solve this problem. Now, the problem may perhaps not be not as, you know, not as stringent as I made it sound, because there are things that we can say that say interesting stuff about everything except this. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. This, is, this goes by the name of the boundary to bound map. Right, so uh, this is a story that you know very well in uh, classical, in, in Newtonian mechanics, right? So in Newtonian mechanics, if you have a Hamiltonian, well, uh, let's pick the reduced Hamiltonian. Uh, over R, right? If you, if you look at this, you can solve it for you can solve the equations of motion for positive energy or for negative energies, and you're going to get a perfectly valid, perfect valid solutions, and you can analytically continue one into the other by simply changing the sign of the energy and perhaps doing other things with which we're going to review in a little bit. So the question is, can we do something like that in general? And it turns out that the answer is yes. Um, and uh, I would like to review that. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to review this and uh, this map from, uh, from a Newtonian mechanics point of view, though, organized such that you can do an exercise, replace this Hamiltonian with some function of velocity here or some function of p, and uh, essentially uh, find that, this, that something like that would work to one p.m. order, uh, and then try to construct a more general argument which would work for any v here that's local, in particular local in time, because, uh, because of this. So uh, the idea is, uh, so how do, we, how do we carry out this map in uh, Newtonian mechanics? Well, we want to carry out this map certainly not for, you know, not for the actual solution to the, for the actual orbit, because, you know, nobody on Earth is going to see the actual orbit of, you know, two body systems up in the sky. So we want to carry out this map for observables. So uh, we talked quite a lot about observable scattering observables. So let me finally draw a picture about this. So the main scattering observable is of course the scattering angle. So this is the minimum distance. This is the impact parameter. And the scattering angle is this. So this is for hyperbolic motion. Now for bound motion, Uh, there are several several interesting observables, but let me pick one of them which turns out to be closely related to this. So here is the center of force. In Newtonian mechanics, this is, uh, uh, you know, the orbits are closed and they don't exactly process. So, uh, but in general relativity, they process. So 
meaning that there is a periastron advance. So this is, uh, uh, I guess the periastron is here. Let me, let me draw it here. So uh, the orbit processes, and that every half orbit, there is some delta chi here, some change in the angle that says that the, you know, the orbit doesn't close and it goes on and makes a flower, basically. So uh, it turns out that there's a close relation between this, let me actually call it theta here again, between this angle and that angle. And that, uh, that has to do with this. So uh, let's write, let's assume for a second that uh, 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 that we know the solution to, uh, uh, you know, we know the trajectory, and then the angle, the scattering angle would be this. Right, so this is uh, basically integrates uh, along half the trajectory, so that gives us half the angle. That's the origin of the two here. There's a very similar formula for for this angle, which of course amounts to integrating again the equation or the angle as a function of r from the minimum distance to the maximum distance. This would be r min, this would be r max. Right? So there is uh, this other angle here. Um, maybe I should call this a different letter. Theta is, uh, is again pi plus 2L into R max dr over R square pr. All right, so uh, who are our min and who are our max? Well, our min, uh, in both cases, pr is a solution to E equals H of pr square plus L square over R square. So that defines pr. So who is our min? Well, our min, and here both our min and our max, there are solutions to the equation PR equals zero. We briefly discussed that the other day. There's another way of phrasing this, which is just angular momentum conservation. L infinity square equals L square. So in this form, this says that P at infinity, or in here, uh, square B square equals uh, P square R square at R min or R max. So uh, there's, of course, another term in L square, which is p dot r square, but p dot r is zero here because uh, uh, the coordinate is orthogonal on the momentum. That's the statement that pr is zero. Okay. So uh, if you solve this, what you're going to find is uh, two solutions. Two solutions. Um, and uh, those solutions are... two solutions, and the two solutions are r plus minus equals minus g m, so m is the total mass divided by the total energy, minus plus square root of uh, g square, nu square, which is the symmetric mass ratio, total mass to the four divided by total energy square, and then uh, plus L square divided by nu m times the energy. Okay. So uh, this is general. I haven't specified any sign for the energy or any sign for the angular momentum. So uh, now for uh, hyperbolic motion or for positive energy. For positive energy, R plus is negative, so this is unphysical. Which is why this integral runs only from one r to somewhere, infinity in that case. And r minus is minus gm over e uh, plus g nu square m to the four over e square. Uh, it looks like I'm missing a new here. And then there is uh, plus 2L square, oops, L square over new ME. All right. Now, what about bound motion? 
Well, there is certainly R minus. I mean, now both of them should be physical. There is still R minus, which looks very much like this thing, except that I'm going to enforce the negativity of the energy. GM square nu divided by norm of E uh, plus G nu square G square m to the 4 divided by e square minus a square over nu m e square root. All right, so uh, this is one of them. If you compare, this is, of course, just change in sign of the energy and nothing else. Now, the question that we might care to answer is, can we reconstruct our max out of the data in the hyperbolic motion? And the reason to attempt to answer this is you know, simply the desire of connecting amplitude-based results to bound results while bypassing the use of the Hamiltonian. So for that, we need to rewrite this uh, R plus because this is, uh, this is R plus or R max. This is the one thing that uh, uh, that we still need to figure out if we want to construct this peri astronaut dance. So uh, we need to rewrite it in a clever way. So uh, that clever way is the following. I am going to write this R min, uh, R minus. I'm going to pull out this L square and put it out there. So R plus out of this, it's just uh, this thing with a minus sign. So, uh, we can also get this one out of that, especially if it's written in this clever way, by changing the sign of the energy and by also changing the sign of the angular momentum. So now we, know we have all the pieces to relate directly the periastron advance and the scattering angle. And to do this, we're going to cheat. We're going to take this interval and we're going to introduce a random point and I'm going to pick that random point to see that infinity. So instead of integrating like this, this is uh, the R coordinate, instead of integrating from R min to R max, like so, I am going to integrate first this way and then that way and subtract these two pieces out. So uh, we're going to write theta as pi plus 2L integral from R min to infinity minus integral from R max to infinity of the same dr over R square P. So uh, this is pi plus 2L Integral, our min is this guy, so this is our hyperbolic of minus E and L, infinity, minus integral from our hyperbolic minus E and minus L of the same thing. So overall we find that theta is uh, minus pi plus uh, chi of E and L, oops, minus E and L, minus chi of minus E and minus L. So this is uh, uh, the so-called boundary to bound map. of Kalin and Porto. Now, of course, what I derived here for you is just a Newtonian mechanics version of it. Um, you can pretty much go through everything I said if you 
uh, on your own if you go if you uh, restore some f of p here. Uh, if you want to go beyond um, linear in R and replace this with an arbitrary potential of R and P, then you need a lot more machinery to do it. But uh, uh, this is detailed in their paper. And uh, uh, long story short, the formula in the box still holds. So the important thing that went into this is that there is a potential V which is local. So if you wish, by construction, by construction, uh, it does not cover potentials that capture something like this, at least the off-shell potential that captures that. Of course, as I was emphasizing here, um, the, there, there is a very local potential that generates the scattering angle and captures this and knows about this non-local effect in some integrated fashion. And one can apply this formula to that. The result happens to be wrong, uh, experimentally wrong, in the sense that when you know, one can take the results obtained from PN bound calculations and the results are different. And this is just an effect of, uh, of the non-locality that is not suitably incorporated. So the problem, which uh, um, perhaps I'm going to leave as a homework for you, is uh, solve this problem, find the map. I'm not going to collect that homework. <laughs> so find the map that accounts for non-local in time, non-locality in time, non-locality in time. Any questions? Okay. No questions. All right. The next thing that I wanted to point out is uh, perhaps a little bit of an inconsistency in what I've been saying for the last four lectures and a half, I guess. So I've been trying to sell this intuition that, well, we are looking for classical physics. Therefore, pretty much anything that's UV divergent is, in fact, shouldn't be present, is, in fact, quantum mechanical. So uh, it has no place in what we're talking about. So uh, this said, let's have a look at this particular diagram, which you know, in all fairness, you don't want to compute as, as it is, but uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, four. Okay. And in particular, not really, so oh, again, all the vertical ones except this, they are messengers, and uh, the horizontal guys, they are uh, matter. So uh, let's have a look at everything in this diagram except the bottom, except the part that's below the dashed line. Let's think of this also as a, uh, you know, there are gravitons here, there are two derivatives everywhere and so on. So if you count, uh, if you count uh, what this thing might, this Compton-like amplitude, what it gives us as a term in the effective action, it would give something like this. There's a D4L to the 4, because there are 1, 2, 3, 4 loops. How many propagators we've got here? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So there's an L square to the 9. So I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm counting. I'm imagining that all momenta in here are large, and I'm trying to ascertain whether something in here happens to be ultraviolet divergent. So uh, there is this 9 propagators. There are how many momenta? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. L to the 10 from these vertices. Up here, I'm going to remember that you know, the way we've been counting, there are uh, you know, things start here with external momenta because of the soft expansion. So, uh, or rather, the expansion in small q. So there is nothing from these vertices. And then, again, as a term in the effective action, there are two gravitons sneaking out here. 
and uh, you know, two gravitons on, the, on their own, they are not gauge invariant. They need, to come, they need to enter in a gauge invariant fashion. So these two guys, they need to enter, the only gauge invariant combination of two gravitons is two Rs. Anything with a single R is perhaps zero if you contract it with, uh, with two scalars because the derivatives sit in the wrong place. So that means that there should be a removal of four momenta from inside, the ones that make up the Rs. So uh, let's see. If we count, there are L to the, there is L to the, what, 16, uh, 26 minus 4, that's 22, divided by 18. Uh, oh, there is also 1, 2, 3, 4. Those propagators are still there. Uh, right, so it's 18 plus 4, that's L to the 22. Ta-da! So this is UV divergent. Why is that? What is the purpose in life of this UV divergence? Well, the purpose in life of this UV divergence happens to be that uh, it exposes that there's a mixing that occurs here. And uh, at some or loop order, namely this one, we should stop thinking of these particles as being point-like, and we should worry about the fact that they have finite size. So at this loop order, which admittedly is a little high, uh, we should no longer th think of these as point particles, but we should somehow incorporate the fact that, uh, uh, that these particles have uh, finite size. So the question is, how do we do this? Uh, and uh, naively, this little exercise tells us what we should be doing. We should be including some terms that could absorb this divergence in the regular ultraviolet renormalization of quantum field theory. So expectation the action should include terms like well, uh, like what? Well, two R's, two phi's, uh, and then some derivatives. Right. So why this? Well, the two R's is because we have these two guys that, uh, uh, that cross this dashed line. Two phi's, well, because we're scattering the same phi's, the same fields. Uh, and these derivatives are here just to uh, saturate some of the indices here. There are, in fact, several operators that one can pick out here, but uh, uh, there are, in fact, three operators, but two of them, only two of them are independent. And uh, they all look like this. Okay, so uh, now why on earth would this thing capture finite size? This is, I wrote this down just based on general quantum field theory considerations. I want to introduce a counter term. Why does this have anything to do with finite size? So I would like to spend the next half hour or so worrying about that. And the hidden reason to worry about this is because finite size effects capture all sorts of interesting things even before they uh, are required for the normalization. They, uh, you know, for people doing, you know, worrying about the structure of neutron stars, these finite size effects include information about, say, the equation of state of neutron stars. Uh, which is a long way of saying is that uh, an equation of state for the nuclear matter, which people have been trying to probe a trick for a while. Mm -hmm. 
the other hidden reason to talk about this is that these effects have been relatively uh, have received relatively little attention in the literature, so there are a number of open problems which are relatively easy to address. Um, the other open problems, like that one, well, they are a little harder. And other open problems, like going to actually do that calculation at four or five loops, that are even harder. So, uh, anyway, open problems. Okay, so uh, how do we connect these with finite size effects? So, uh, so, first let's worry a little bit about the structure of the potential that we would be uh, you know, hunting for, right? We want to, we still want to capture everything in terms of a potential for whatever reason. So what we talked until now, uh, it always looked more or less like this. Uh, GM over R, some power. So I'm going to, I'm writing this now in position space um, and, and then some coefficients. So these C1 and C2 is what we computed earlier. So well, there is another way of writing this. Uh, the numerator here is the Schwarzschild radius, or at least proportional to the Schwarzschild radius. So now if we have some body which, is, uh, which has some radius r, which is larger but not terribly larger than the Schwarzschild radius, well, then clearly the same ratio r over this capital R over r has to be classical. If r Schwarzschild by r is classical, then the other ratio should also be classical. So, one should expect something like this. Now, this, uh, this size here is typically, again, it's typically larger than RS. And the, the way to think about this is perhaps as, a, as an effective field theory turned upside down. Right? Why, is it, uh, uh, why is it turned upside down? Well, we usually integrate out small scale effects but uh, uh, and we are leaving, uh, you know, we are leaving, uh, we're, we are left with a theory that's valid at larger distances. What we really want to do here is integrate out um, R scale effects, and be left with a point particle theory. the one that we've been discussing, the one that gives us this, uh, this expansion in RS. And um, uh, we still want to do calculation in that, in that theory because we like it. It's simple up to inclusion of these effects. So, uh, right, so let's see how can we, uh, uh, how can we Im introduce these guys. So, uh, this, uh, there are several ways of phrasing this, but perhaps the best way is to think of uh, maybe electrodynamics. Imag <laughs> Imagine that you have a blob of charge. It's perfectly spherical. The only thing that it has is its charge. It doesn't have any other multiples. So uh, how do we... Uh, uh, if we put it inside... So if, if we want to know how it reacts to a field, we have to do two things. First of all, we have to put it in a field to actually give it something, to give it some more, some more multiples, and then probe those multiples with another field. We can't probe it with the same field that generates the multiples. So uh, that's a long way of saying that we first induce a dipole that starts out its life as this. This is of x and t. This is of x and t, x prime, t prime. So this is dj of x prime, t prime, plus uh, chi i, j, k, several arguments, two fields, dj, dk. This is x, x prime, x double prime. There are some t's there as well. x prime, x double prime, and so on. 
So this is the dipole. Yeah, this is the electric field that's being induced by. Uh, sorry, this is. Huh. Luckily, the word made, the words made no sense. You should have stopped me. <laughs> All right, now everything is clear, right? So there's a dipole that's being induced by some external electric field, and the proportionality coefficient is a susceptibility. And the same here. This is a nonlinear version of the same, and it goes on. Uh, it goes on forever. So this is D. This is the dipole moment of this blob of charge. And then to probe this, we need to put it in, a, in an additional field. Alternatively, we just write an action which depends on E, which is obtained from this one by integrating it. So uh, there's a one half, there's an integral uh, E of X and T, E I of X and T, chi AJ of X and T, X prime T prime, Ej of x prime t prime plus yeah, 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 lots of other terms that come out of this. This one, of course, that comes with a third and so on. So uh, this is the action that would describe this blob of charge placed in, a, uh, in an electric field E. There's, of course, an analogous expression for GR. It just has a lot more indices. Just think of this E as carrying two indices, this guy four, this guy two. This thing becomes just uh, a Riemann tensor. All right, so uh, now what do we do with this? And what's the relation between this and that? Well, the observation is, of course, that this thing is, strictly speaking, something that's non-local, right? It depends on x and x prime, t and t prime. So uh, we can expand this in local operators. We can expand this around the origin. And, um, well, what do we do? It's a lot more efficient to do this in momentum space. So it's one half integral e tilde of, uh, of q, chi of q and q prime, e of q prime, and then there is a delta of q minus q prime, which just says that there is no momentum that uh, flows in here, that the susceptibility is in fact just, seriously, is in fact just a, a reaction of the body, it doesn't actually bring any any energy so uh, then we can expand this this is chi of zero plus q derivative of chi at zero plus q square derivative of chi deriva second derivative of chi at zero and so on and this is a little bit glib right there should be indices here i i and uh, i mean this is uh, if you wish non-relativistic physics, there should be a d by dt, there should be a d by dx, and so on. But morally, they are all of this type. And here, there are contractions again. So uh, what does this become? Uh, so if we take this, plug it back in there, and Fourier transform back, and we make use of this delta function, everything becomes local, just a lot more of it. Right? There, there will be this uh, chi of 0, e of x square, maybe with a one half, plus nabla chi, which perhaps should be thought of as something with an extra index, uh, and then uh, there's an e, and then there's this q, but upon Fourier transform, that turns into a derivative of e, plus nabla square chi, and then there's nabla e, nabla e. And again, this is schematic. There are contractions between these and those, and so on. But uh, this illustrates the fact that if we have an extended body, which reacts to some external field here, E, or if you want, you can change it to gravitational field, then all of that can be uh, replaced with uh, a series of local operators and uh, the coefficients of those the coefficients of those operators these are constants and they carry information about the size of this body and the properties of this body as it reacts to external fields so uh, these things are typically called love numbers so describing a uh, an extended body amounts to just 
listing its lot numbers and um, perhaps using them. All right, any questions? Okay. So I'm not going to tell you how to compute these guys because uh, that depends on whatever theory captures this. For neutron stars, it's nuclear physics. For a blob of charge, it's um, electrodynamics, plus whatever, uh, whatever interactions between constituents you want to give it. Uh, my, uh, uh, what I'm going to do, however, is to describe what these things do as far as observations from outside are concerned, in particular how these things will affect, say, scattering angles in our case, or perhaps peri-astronaut advances, if you care to use this, or if you have other means to construct them. Right, that's, uh, that's the story. So uh, for that, I need to be a little bit more precise about this. And there is, uh, you know, one, one can carry out some analysis here, which operators are uh, independent and which are not. And this analysis has been carried out. There is, uh, uh, for gravity, the result is as follows. Uh, it will be just a, a mass distribution, and it will be a quadrupole. Yeah. yeah so uh, there will be a quadrupole here, and then, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually about to write, I'm about to write down exactly what this is. So, uh, for gravity, for gravity, uh, I think there's a question here. Oh, sorry. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so. This was. Uh, the, the relation between these two things is basically that it, it's linear response, if you wish. So di should be del s. This is s by del ei. That's the origin of the one half, for example. Yeah, that, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, what I'm going to write here involves, uh, again, it, it involves this little bit of cleanup that, and uh, picking a nice set of operators which are independent. And it turns out to be convenient to define two things, something called E mu nu, something called B mu nu, which are related to the Weyl tensor or to the Riemann tensor. So uh, this is our mu, mu alpha, nu beta, u alpha, uh, u beta. So this is for a body that moves with velocity v. And v mu nu is uh, epsilon mu alpha um, rho sigma r rho sigma nu beta u alpha u beta, the other beta. So in terms of these variables, the action, the analogous action looks fairly nice. And uh, uh, complicated. So, uh, how does it look like? So, uh, the first operator that one might care to write that involves these things is just um, S equals or L equals phi e mu nu, e mu nu some coefficient here, call it A, uh, actually no, C e, uh, C e square plus another coefficient which is C B square, phi, B mu nu, B mu nu, phi, yeah. Uh, the second one, 
mu, nu, mu, nu, uh, rho sigma, rho sigma, alpha, beta, their contract. All right. So this is, these are the first, and if you wish, the simplest terms that you can, that you can write down that capture finite size effects. And those are exactly these guys that I was describing here, right? Uh, two R's, or rather two vial tensors, four derivatives, and two phi's. And uh, if, you, if you Fourier transform these, uh, these U's and actually write them as derivatives, then they become particularly symmetric. You can put two of them to act on one, two of them to act on the other, and so on. Right. There are, in fact, a lot more other terms. And uh, let me write for you just one example. And these guys are the, the uh, so this is, these are, if you wish, quadrupole-like interactions. But uh, these ones, uh, they're quadrupoles because they have two derivatives in them. Uh, one can construct higher multiples, uh, mu1 to mu n. Uh, So uh, these guys look like look as follows. Uh, v nu n, v nu three, and then the L row one, the L row L. So there is an entire enterprise to actually classify these things. Mu one alpha, mu one beta, and then some projectors here. Mu n, mu n. Mu three, mu three. Del row one. Del row L, symmetrized. Del alpha. Del beta. And then uh, the Lagrangian involves phi coefficients. Mu L, phi, E L, mu one, mu n. And n here, E, mu one mu n l phi and there's b analogs okay so these are these are if you wish the analogs of the linear response uh, they are the analogs of uh, everything that comes out from the expansion of the susceptibility here with two indices therefore the thing with two fields um, and uh, that's what they are. I didn't write who P is. So P mu nu is delta mu nu minus u mu mu nu. Yeah. Is there a that the yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. So uh, these guys, they become these guys here. Thank you. More questions? OK. So uh, now we have uh, plenty of things at our disposal, lots of operators. Um, we can construct potentials. And we can construct scattering angles. Uh, now, I should also add to this uh, oh yeah, I, uh, I got distracted. So this is linear response. There's of course there are of course there are friends that come out of out uh, that come from the nonlinear things. So uh, just think of them as uh, stringing together three of these or four of these. The only restriction is to make sure that all the indices are contracted properly, um, and then you have a, uh, a perfectly valid tidal operator. So uh, now we. Uh, uh, we need to figure out how to compute these, and uh, pretty much everything that we discussed comes, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, um, these guys. So somewhere in here, are these people here, the things with many derivatives. Uh, these things 
couple, you know, these love numbers, the derivatives of this susceptibility, they will couple to higher multiples of the electric field. So by angular momentum conservation, these guys should know something about the higher multiples of the body itself. Yeah. So uh, uh, why am I saying that there are higher, I mean, there are of course higher multiples of the uh, gravitational field here as well, All right? So everybody here acts, all these derivatives act on, on this is the vial tensor or the Riemann tensor. So all of these are multiples of the gravitational field. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure I follow, but I mean here all here we're not specifying any particular body. This is again a generic, a generic action for which you know just specify what chi is or its derivatives, evaluate the origin, and yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the story. Uh, what are this? A story. So I'm not going to do calcula detailed calculations. I'm just going to draw some pictures here. And uh, I shouldn't leave it as a homework uh, to actually do the calculations. But it's worth thinking about how you might want to do them in principle. And I'm going to discuss a little, uh, a, small, a small trick at some point. Uh, but uh, anyhow, so uh, what do we do with this? Well, we, uh, in, in particular, what's the leading order at which any one of these terms will contribute? A leading order. Of course, leading order depends on the number of um, on the number of uh, vial tensors, right? Each vial tensor gives one graviton. Uh, don't pay attention to indices because they are not correlated. Um, yeah, each, uh, each vial tensor gives us a graviton. Therefore, if we have two vial tensors in this operator, then we're going to get a Feynman rule that looks like this, two gravitons sticking out. And uh, this, is, this dot is not a three, well, it is a three-level amplitude, but it's also a vertex. This is, uh, this is this, uh, this mu guys or the... Uh, or what I call up there uh, C, C e square, right? So this is a vertex that comes out of uh, that comes out of this action here. So with two e's, that's the only kind of Feynman graphs that you can draw, um, at least to leading order. Of course, there are higher ones, uh, but uh, and the same C e two, and so on, uh, from expanding the the vial tensor beyond leading order. But uh, we're not going to worry about this. We're going again to worry about leading order. Now, if we have uh, n vial tensors, then we have, of course, a more complicated object. This is 1. This is n. This is n. And again, the coefficient here is uh, one of the many love numbers that we have. So. Uh, Uh, the potential comes out of the two body ver the, of the two body scattering of some probe or some let's let's consider for the time being a featureless particle let's call this little phi two and then we have this phi that has uh, uh, all these multiples inserted so the leading term comes from this triangle diagram with the c square here so um, we don't need to think too hard the result is just uh, the amplitude is um, um, whatever the Feynman rule is. So there's an L here, L minus Q, uh, actually minus L plus Q. Yeah, L minus Q. So uh, the amplitude is uh, uh, this vertex uh, times here we have some stress tensors.
and then there are sums over states, these states here. And then we have the propagators, L square, L minus Q square, and then there is this guy, which is just uh, L plus P2 minus 2, just as before, L times P2. So uh, just carry out this calculation, match against the same EFT that we had before, and the result will be V. Okay. So uh, I promised a trick. So uh, for my last trick, actually maybe it's next to last trick. For my last trick, uh, the last trick is about carrying out the state sum, right? So both Donald and I discussed uh, state sums, and we had this uh, epsilon of p, or rather of l, mu nu, star of l, and it had some expression, which. Uh, could be simplified to just uh, the, the Donder type numerator, uh, mean euro sigma. So uh, let's think a little bit what goes on here in this sum over states. We have this vertex. This vertex contains two polarization tensors, mu nu of L and rho sigma of uh, L minus Q. And uh, all th those guys come from, they're just the asymptotic states that, that come out of the, of the vial tensor. So, uh, and up at the top is really just some stress tensor, T mu nu, of this point particle uh, with uh, momentum P. So, uh, with momentum P2, which is just, uh, uh, P2 mu, P2 mu, on shell. And it is on shell because uh, uh, both these lines are on shell. So uh, if we combine this and this, so in, in, and then there is an, yeah. So the vertex at the top is V prime, this is V prime. Is uh, T mu mu, epsilon mu mu. So if we multiply this with this and with that, what happens is that this sewing ultimately amounts to taking the vertex that comes out of, uh, of the tidal operator and replacing in it epsilon mu nu with this projector, p mu nu rho sigma, p mu nu rho sigma um, times t mu nu. That's what the sewing does. It's simply a multi uh, It's simply a replacement rule. So, uh, um, yeah. And uh, if you work this out, this is just uh, there are some numbers here. There's a kappa that comes out of uh, this. There's a kappa there. It's minus kappa p two mu uh, p two nu minus m square over d minus 2. And then uh, there is um, something, eta mu nu, of course. OK. So uh, ultimately, this, the integrand, the numerator of the integrand of this one loop amplitude is essentially the value of this tidal operator evaluated on this thing. Right? h mu nu gets replaced with this. So uh, yeah. And then uh, with this in hand, there is, uh, you know, there, there is a fair amount of algebra that one, that one can go through. And one can find what this, uh, what this amplitude is, this m. And of course, it depends very much on the details of this, how many derivatives of each kind there are, and so on and so forth. Um, in this calculation, there will be uh, one particular class of integrals that you will need to worry about. And they look this way. Uh, Q 
u to the 1 minus 2l. There is uh, l dotted into u1 to the power 2l. And uh, l square, l minus q square, and then minus 2l dot u2 minus i epsilon. Uh, so this is the one type of integral that you need to worry about when you evaluate pretty much any amplitude that looks like this. And this has an analytic expression. What that analytic expression doesn't is doesn't really matter. You can look it up in Smirnov's book. Or if you really want to know it immediately, just ask me when I'm done. Okay, so... Uh, I don't think there is any real reason for me to write down an example. Um, you know, one just proceeds and the, the result will be some function of y, some function of uh, masses, and uh, it will be manifestly proportional to one of these coefficients here. This, that, depending on the, on the, uh, depending on the operator. Now, there is one other thing that I would like to mention in the remaining five, ten minutes or so. Uh, which has to do with uh, nonlinear response. And uh, in particular, it's connected with, uh, with the idea that it's always a good idea to attempt to be flexible in your calculational methods. And so we did pretty much everything uh, in the last week or so in momentum space. Uh, so uh, here is... Uh, here is something for you to try. Uh, imagine that some joker hands you uh, an operator with n gravitons. So n vial tensors, and they ask you to find the leading order potential. This is n here. One. n doesn't have to be arbitrary. Just pick n to be 5, and already you have a hard time. So uh, the idea is... How can we do a calculation like this uh, without too much pain and suffering? So uh, as an indication for what we can do, uh, imagine a much simpler exercise. Consider some, you know, some uh, phi to the fourth, some, uh, consider a free, free scalar theory. Uh, so a Lagrangian that's just d phi squared, d phi, d phi bar. Uh, perhaps with a mass, if you want to make it complicated. And in this free theory, consider computing the, the, the correlation function involving uh, four operators. Let's make it a trace here. Give them some color. Otherwise, it will be too dull. Phi phi bar, point x. Trace of phi phi bar, point y is 1 x2. x3. x4. All right. So uh, there are two ways to do this calculation. One of them is to just do a position space calculation. I'm going to come to this in, in a little bit. But there is another version, which is very much closer to what we have been doing, namely, take one of these operators, trace of, well, take all of them, really, of x, write them as a Fourier transform. Uh, and then uh, um, use momentum space to carry out the weak contractions from this action and then attempt to Fourier transform this back. So if you decide uh, accidentally to proceed along this way, this correlation function, call it C for lack of a better name, is going to look really disgusting. It's going to look like e to the i q i x i. And then the momentum space version of this correlator is going to be something like this. d d l over 2 pi to the d. So graphically, this is a loop. There is Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 flowing in through the vertices. There is a loop momentum, which is also accidentally mass massive. We might consider making our life slightly easier, making that massless. 
Uh, anyhow, so this is L square plus M minus M square. L plus Q1 square minus M square. Uh, L minus Q1 or plus, plus Q2 square minus M square. Right, this integral, I'm sure it appeared last week and uh, uh, um, you ran away very quickly from it because it's a complicated hypergeometric function. And uh, so Fourier transform that back to position space is a pain in the neck. However, if we did the calculation directly in position space, then things would be substantially simpler. Uh, it's just a product of uh, four propagators from point x1 to point x2, x2 to x3, x3 to x4, x4 to x1. And uh, in the massless case, that propagator is just 1 over x minus y square. In the massive case, it's slightly more complicated. It's some Bessel function, but uh, it's some k Bessel function. But no matter, it's still a simple function. This should become, in position space, just a product of, uh, uh, call this p from xi minus xi plus 1 to 4. So uh, the point of this little, uh, uh, little discussion is that it's worth being flexible. It's worth thinking to do the calculation in position space, whereas perhaps one might be tempted based on Feynman, Feynman diagrammatics to do that calculation in momentum space. The same happens here. If you think of this, you have you know, lots of loop integrals that you need to compute if you did a calculation in, momen in momentum space. However, if you, because these guys are in fact cut, all of them, uh, it's worth Fourier transforming to position space. And uh, if you Fourier transform to position space, then pretty much all the numerators here turn into derivatives. Uh, each of these contractions will become just the one over R to some power that comes from the propagator. Uh, and then the evaluation of this rather complicated, I might add, integral amounts to just taking a sequence of derivatives. Okay. Um, is there anything else that I meant to add here? Mm. If you really are interested, we can discuss how to do this calculation uh, in the exercise session. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention is uh, that, of course, this little story of ours is not restricted to tidal operators. But if you so desire to probe physics beyond GR, then uh, you may be able to. And to do that, all one has to do is uh, pick your favorite higher dimension operators that correct GR from whatever source you might have. If you like string theory, which I personally do, uh, you might choose some of these. Uh, if you don't, you can generate whatever you want here, almost whatever you want, by integrating out some massive matter, some random, random collection of massi massive matter. And uh, right. then uh, with this in hand, well, with, with a choice of action in hand, uh, the resulting uh, uh, Hamiltonian can be constructed exactly the same way as before, except that now uh, the graphs that we need to worry about look a lot more like this. So uh, this is also something that has not been studied all that much. Certainly there is no systematic analysis of what operators can be added here and of their effects to potentials and other ob and observables. And this is of course something that uh, in some distant future will become important. So uh, this is something for you to perhaps think about. So on that note, uh, I am running out of steam here, so uh, I will stop. Thank you. More questions for Radu? 
this is your next to last opportunity. So. <laughs> I see people are looking tired. <laughs> are you sure? Think about it. Okay. <laughs> Maybe wait for the microphone. Hi. So uh, on the first problem, uh, you were talking about um, a mapping topic. between hyperbolic and bound yeah. problems. And uh, I was wondering, because um, every black hole space time, I mean, uh, we, I mean, we can define the black holes asymptotically uh, well. They're well, they're separated, so we can define in states. And, mm -hmm. and then, um, for all those kinds of spaces, considering only gravitational interactions, there are no bound states. I mean, adiabatically maybe, because they look very similar when they're spiraling, but yes. they rather. Spire, spire until yes. they merge or they just scatter. Yes, that's correct. So, so what am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just, just, just say it outright. What am I talking about? Uh, so what am I talking about is, of course, in pretty much everything that I said, um, I'm neglecting gravitational radiation. And the instability that you're describing, of course, is due to emission of radiation, right? So. Uh, you know, this map that I was describing, that holds, of course, in the absence of any emission. Uh, of course, one could attempt to include uh, emission of radiation. That's an even bigger problem than as far as this map is concerned. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the idea is, of course, to find a map for, say, the conservative motion and then include ra emission of radiation in some form of adiabatic fashion, at least for a while, until it becomes too large to actually be treated that way. Okay. Oh, yeah, so the question is, if you have, uh, you know, a space-time that contains two black holes, that's not stable. Either they go off to infinity and then you have a scattering event or they merge eventually and then you have, a, you know, a bound motion or perhaps a captured and bound motion and then eventual coalescence. Whereas here I was assuming that everything is stable. So the answer was that, yes, I'm assuming everything's stable because I'm ignoring... Um, uh, emission of radiation, which is the source of instability, of the instability. Yeah. There is a question. question. Oh, that was you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any further questions? No, he, it was just his message asking for questions. <laughs> All right, then let's thank Rado for his very nice set of lectures. Thank you.